So first of all, Father, we pray that you would uh, receive our worship, our fellowship tonight, and our desire to honor you in your word. And Father, we know that there are so many needs within our lives, and we're living at a time when it is so evident, at least for us in ministry who are dealing constantly with the, the challenge in, in the lives of people from demonic activity going on, strange occult things taking place, to marriage issues, to children, to family, finance, it just never ends. Health issues, it's overwhelming if we had to take this on our own, but we don't. You are the Lord. You're the one who died on the cross for us. You're the one who rose again from the dead. You're the one who made us, and you're the one that has equipped us to even not only survive this world, but to be more than conquerors. So Father God, tonight, those here and those beyond, we pray that you just magnify and manifest a very special presence of your Holy Spirit in healing and comfort, conviction, instruction, edification, and Lord, as your Bible commands us, that we should sanctify in our hearts the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might always be able to give an answer to those who ask of us for the reason, for the hope that we have within us, and to answer them with respect and with dignity. So Father, we pray tonight for your presence in a very sweet way, and we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen to that. So you guys, we're going to go uh, to the first question that's up here. And uh, again, these came in, I assume, earlier today when, when the notice went out. What does it mean that Jesus makes his ministers a flame of fire? This is a reference that we earlier covered in the book of Hebrews, and that is that the ministers of fire, it's not pastors and preachers. I know some scholars will say, and they're predominantly those of the, the uh, Puritan era, they will say that it refers to pastors holding forth the word of God. And I'm not saying it doesn't say to the, apply to that, uh, but personally I believe that the scripture uh, makes it clear that it's actually angels that are God's ministers to execute or to um, expand whatever he is doing. Uh, in the way of judgment, his ministers are his flaming fire, uh, representatives of his righteousness and of his holiness. So when it says, what does it mean that Jesus makes his ministers a flame of fire? Uh, those are ministering angels, I believe. Now, somebody again might counter and say, I believe that includes uh, the, those that are called to the pulpit ministry. Um, I don't know. But angels for sure. So that's a, that's a good question. That's a, that's a deep question in Hebrews. Uh, next question. I'm looking at both. Why is Joshua called, uh, why is Joshua called Jesus in Hebrews 4.8? Joshua's name and Jesus' name it has the exact same meaning. So if, if we were all Hebrews, if we were Jews, uh, we would say uh, Yahushua. Jesus is the Greek rendering of, of the Hebrew Joshua. And so it's, it's interchangeable. It's the, the name's the same, means the same. So just know this, Joshua, though, in the Bible is not, Joshua the person is not Jesus, right? So we want to understand that rightly, correctly. Um, it's beautiful, though, to realize that when you, when you look at so many of the names of those who God mentions in the Bible and or uses in the Bible, uh, even to the point of a book uh, like Isaiah, these names, many of these names of these authors of Scripture, their names mean or have a reference to uh, God being salvation or God being the Redeemer. Or like Daniel, Daniel is God is my judge as an example. So their, their names, the Hebrew names are rooted uh, most often in names of God. Um, a friend of mine, I forget the name, 
I, oh, well, for one thing, I can't, I'm trying to think of my friends uh, in Israel who has his son, his name was in my, my head right now, but I can't remember the meaning, but I'll default over to Amir. Amir's son, Ariel. I believe, if I have this right by remembrance, that Ariel is a lion of God, if I remember right, uh, or prince of God. But they all have that name like that, and it's, a, it's beautiful. But Joshua, Jesus, same name, same meaning, uh, spoken in a different language. So, next question is, can you explain how Jesus is the scapegoat? That's a great question. So, in the Old Testament or temple period, the priests were given the instructions to separate or to segregate two specific offerings regarding the atonement of the nation. Most of us focus on uh, the Passover lamb, and for good reason. And in fact, we're coming up in Resurrection Week, Passion Week, right? We're coming up on what we would talk and we're going to teach on this is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb. In biblical typology, biblical, listen, biblical typology that was lived out in actuality, before Christ went to the cross, for over a thousand years, a Passover lamb was offered ever since the children of Israel left Egypt. Remember that? And they did that every year. God gave instructions then that there's the Passover lamb, but then there's the scapegoat. So what is that? One lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the nation, and some of the blood that would be taken would be placed on the head of the scapegoat. So the priest would take and put some of the blood on the head. So think about, think about this, this goat that's there, and the priest puts his hands and in an act of symbolism, transfers the innocent blood of the sacrifice onto this other animal that represents the nation of Israel. And they would tie a scarlet cord to one of its horns. And then the priest would drive it out of the city on the north side, always on the north side, by the way, it's interesting, North and east. So for those of you who have been to Jerusalem, in your mind's eye, how, well, before I go any further, how many of you have been to Jerusalem? Raise your hands. All right, enough to know this. Anybody remember the Damascus Gate? It's the north gate. It's the gate that we most often avoid because it's not safe to usually go through that gate. Uh, that's, that's the Arab section, and violence could break out at any time. It's not an easy gate to go through, but it's very populated, it's very noisy, it's very loud, um, and that section has been there for so, so very long, but imagine those of you who have been to Jerusalem, that, that goat would have been escorted out through there, then they would have made a right turn, so you're going north through the Damascus gate, because it leads to Damascus. You make a right-hand turn, and you go east, and you go over Mount Scopus, and now from Mount Scopus, which is at the top of the Mount of Olives, there are priests stationed at each hilltop descending down into the Judean wilderness, down towards the Dead Sea. Watch this. The priest puts the blood on, drives the goat away. The priest at each hilltop keeps driving the goat away. Drives it away, drives it away, drives it away until miles. I'm going to guess. I'll be off, but I'm thinking 20, 20, 25 miles down from, because you know, Jerusalem's elevated roughly over 4,000 feet. Down to the Jordan River Valley, you're getting down close to sea level and then down eventually below sea level. So the goat would be driven down, but there's hilltops along the way. There were priests stationed that once the goat was out of sight, the priest would shout back to the, the hilltop that before him, the hilltop before him, the hilltop before him, until it got to the high priest there in Jerusalem. Meaning they would announce, um, 
the, 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 there's a term, there's a Hebrew word, that the scapegoat is gone. We no longer can see it. So then he shouts to his buddy on the hill, can't see it anymore. He would turn around, all echoing back toward, to Jerusalem until the high priest heard, we can't see the scapegoat anymore. And that, by the way, is where we get that term. Oh, that, was, that guy, that woman, oh, they were the scapegoat. What does that mean? It means all the guilt and shame were placed on them. They paid for it or they, they, they took it away. And so when that was all lived out, you say, I thought the Passover lamb was enough. It is enough. But this act was a visible display of your sins have been taken away. As far as the east is from the west, so far as your sins been taken away from you. And so that was the operation or the function of the scapegoat. If you want to get more into that, it's a beautiful study. It's a, it, that would be considered a word study. You'd look up scapegoat in um, a good biblical study. I would maybe look at the Blue Letter Bible. You may be able to find some good uh, studies in that area. But it's fascinating, for sure. Are you guys okay? You're very quiet tonight. Okay, next one is, my question is regarding Hebrews 12, 1. Who is the great cloud of witnesses, and do they pray for us? The great cloud of witnesses, let's answer it this way. Uh, I like how the, uh, the reformers, the Reformation era, and the Pilgrim Fathers, they talked about the church, think about you and I right now. They talked, they talked about the church having uh, two uh, moments of existence, and this is, this is beautiful. And it's all based off of Hebrews 12. The church exists technically right now in two places. Now the church is one, right? You agree with that? The Bible says the church is one. We have one head. Who's the head? Jesus. We are members of his body, the church. The church is one. But the church is one in two different locations at the exact same time. You know where I'm going with this? They're, that's, that's what they call the church militant and the church triumphant. So what do you mean the church militant? They, they taught all those who are of the church living in this world are fighting evil, fighting temptation, advancing the gospel, dealing with wickedness and injustice and all the stuff that we war against in the things of the spirit. We are the church militant. It means that we're not in heaven yet, Amen. right? I was just talking to somebody uh, a little while ago about how unfair this world is, isn't it? This world is unfair. This world hurts. This world, there's a lot of injustice in this world. And um, if you are looking for all those things to be answered and settled in this world, you're going to be very disappointed. It's never going to happen. So you would have to have perfection. Well, the church triumphant are those who are in heaven. Those who died that are now in heaven. They're, they've, like Paul the Apostle, he said it perfectly in 2 uh, Timothy 4. Paul said, I've kept the faith. I've finished my race. And now what is laid up for me is a crown of righteousness that not only will the Lord give me, but he will give to all those who have loved his appearing. And Paul laid down his According to church history, Paul laid down his neck, his head, on a Roman chopping block, and they cut his head off. And I thought that was amazing. That Paul knew, by the way, how he was going to die. He had been sentenced, and the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul. Isn't it beautiful to think? This is how Christians need to think. Okay, Paul, we're going to cut your head off. Okay. B before you do that, can I write one more chapter to <laughs> Timothy? Sure, go ahead. So he says to Timothy, hey, Timothy, my departure is at hand. You hear how he thinks? I'm still going to answer this question. I haven't got to it yet. <laughs> my departure is at hand, Timothy. I'm, I'm about ready. Look how he's talking. It's like uh, the bus is coming soon. <laughs> We're about ready to board the plane. My departure is at hand. Friends, when we, when we leave this world in what is called death, it's not even fair to even call it death to the Christian. 
we got to think of something else. Promotion. Graduation, promotion, okay. <laughs> Certainly is. For the believer, death at its best has a doorknob and a label and, and, a, and a, na- a label or name on it. We just walk through it as a believer. And we walk from this darkness in this world. We're in, we're in darkness in this world. When we, when we die as a believer, we walk through a door into his glorious light instantly. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. The line, I mean, look at this. The line, the line between those two worlds is, is finer. It's thinner than a, than a hair that separates them. But it's infinite. It's amazing. So the church militant, that's who you and I are right now, according to the Puritans. We are still, so to speak, spiritually slugging it out here. We've got to deal with our lives. We've got to deal with the lives of others and uh, even uh, manifest host of wickedness and all the things. The church triumphant, they're in heaven above and they're rejoicing before the presence of God. You can take a little sneak peek and go to Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and read about what's going on up there right now. Um, In fact, if you've lost, I shouldn't say that either. Christians don't lose other Christians. Oh, I lost my husband. Was he a Christian? Yeah, well, you didn't lose him. He just got, you know, he got mailed up ahead. <laughs> remember, uh, I'm really going off the thing now. Do you guys remember, anybody remember stores like, I'm sorry to say this. Anybody remember Zodis? Yes. Is this like in the old people's service? <laughs> Was it Zodis or TG&Y? Yes. Or Gemco? Yes. Or Fedco? So, do you remember those tubes? You would be at the register buying your stuff, and you would put money, you'd give money to the register, to the, to the, uh, uh, to the cashier, and they would put your money, like let's say you had a $100 bill, which back in those days, I saw a first $100 bill when I was like 11, and I almost fainted. <laughs> my dad had it, which shocked me. It's like, oh my gosh, because I was in a poor house. My dad pulled out a $100 bill, and I thought we were rich. <laughs> But he put the $100 bill in at Jimco or Fedco or whatever it was, and it went, you know, they shut the thing and then press the button, it goes, whoosh, and it's, and it goes somewhere, and while you're, they're bagging the, your goods, and then, whoosh, the thing comes flying right back, and they open it up, and here's your change, and it was like, where'd it go? Where did that go? And wherever it went, there's money, it changes money. Well, think about that. Think about the believer. (laughs) Not in a tube, but... (laughs) So the believer that dies immediately goes to be in the presence of the Lord, the great cloud of witnesses. Now, the debate is this. Do they know what's going on? We don't know for sure. There are some verses that argue if they knew what was going on, then it wouldn't be heaven for them. If they could see us, they would all be crying and bummed out. That's an assumption. I get it, but we can't prove that. On the other side, it does say a great cloud of witnesses. It is possible, and I lean toward this interpretation, it is possible that because they have now entered eternity, they see things as God sees them from his perspective. So that when they see the suffering here, they understand it, whereby we don't understand it much ever at all. But from their perspective, it is, wow, watch what's going to happen. This is going to be amazing. Is that true? We don't know for sure, but it's a strong argument because the great cloud, that means a vast, vast group, are in fact witnesses. The third interpretation is, Generally speaking, there are other fringe interpretations, but the, other, the third interpretation is that they greet every new arrival of saint that enters heaven, just like, you say, well, that's weird, never heard that before. Yes, you have. 
you remember when Stephen was being stoned to death? By the way, Stephen was stoned to death not far from the Damascus Gate we talked about earlier. That's only about a 15-minute walk. When Stephen was being stoned to death, remember Saul of Tarsus was there to uh, consent. He was the one leading the, the martyrdom of Stephen. Remember what Stephen said? Stephen says, behold, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. Which is a shakaroo, everybody. Because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Seated, it says. Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. Stephen didn't say he was seated. Stephen said he stood. And what did Stephen say? He said, into, into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. Same thing, same thing Jesus said. Could it be that every time a saint dies, a, that a believer dies, that the believer sees Jesus stand up to receive you? Stephen did. Why not you? If that's, if that's what's happening then is the great cloud of witnesses witnessing your entrance into heaven. Um, I'm going from ancient memory now, so I wish I could cite the author of this book, but I was reading uh, a, a book on this very topic so long ago, and the word usage in Hebrews suggests what you and I know regarding the Olympics, the marathon specifically. So the, the marathon and the Olympics start at some location. And whatever they start, they start. And how long is a, a, an actual true Olympic marathon? 20, is it 26.3 or point something, whatever it is? Whatever it is, it is what it is. I don't care because I'm not going to ever run it. So <laughs> why should I care? So... It starts, imagine the Christian life. It starts and you go, but it ends in a very, very dramatic way. It would end as you're running, you run into the entrance of the Colosseum. Think about the, think about the Los Angeles Colosseum as a good example. Or SoFi. No, SoFi doesn't work so well as the... Or, the Rose Bowl does, and the Coliseum does in L.A., how you can run in, and there's a track all the way around the field, right? I don't think SoFi has that. So think about a marathon runner. The moment he comes into the stadium through, through the, it's called a vomitorium. I know that sounds gross, but that opening, the Romans called a vomitorium. Uh, when you came in through that, the crowd would go nuts. They would all stand up and cheer because you're the first guy in the marathon to come on into the stadium, which means you're only one or, one or four laps around to finishing and winning. So the whole, thing's, the whole thing ended before this huge crowd of witnesses. And that's a beautiful picture because that is the word usage uh, for the great cloud of witnesses. But let me clear something up right now. Do they pray for us? Uh, the answer to that is no. There are no saints that pray for us. I know that's going to break somebody's heart, but nowhere is that found in Scripture that there is anyone, anyone, in eternity and in heaven praying for us. Only, only one. Yep. There's only one reference to anyone praying for us in heaven, and that is Jesus himself praying to the Father. And um, I know that some, some says, oh, no, I've been praying to Saint... You, whoever, forever, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bible says that we have one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. And um, that's what the Bible teaches. So but that was a long one. Okay, here's a big one. Uh, my question is from Hebrews 9.23, in that did Jesus' atoning death for sinners on the cross also cleanse heaven itself? Not that the triune God needed any sort of cleansing for forgiveness. Rather, our sin stunk to high heaven. <laughs> that's very cute. That's a joke that's, that snuck by, I think. No, his blood didn't have to cleanse heaven because heaven has no sin. 
and that's a, our, it's true though, our sin stinks to high heaven, but um, that's cute. Next, next question. <laughs> what are the two immutable things mentioned in Hebrews 6, 8? Well, you're going to make me go to Hebrews 6, 8 right now. What is it? 6, 18? 6, 18. And it says... That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong uh, consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. The two immutable things is God himself. The two immutable things is exactly what happened with Abraham. Remember, we talked about this in one of our services recently. When God, who could swear by no other, for there's no other greater than God, swore with himself. Which is an amazing thing. If you're Jewish tonight, listen up. In the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis introduces you to not only God being immutable, which means unchangeable. The the suggestion is that God is in fact unchangeable by nature. But why does the topic even come up? Because here, Hebrew is, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is, is echoing Genesis, that when, when Abraham set up the altar and put the sacrifice on the altar as God commanded him, and as Abraham began to shoosh off the vultures that were trying to steal the offering, the Bible tells us that God gave Abraham a deep sleep, remember? And that Abraham fell asleep. And then God proceeded to agree with himself and exhibited that by a flaming torch that passed between the offerings and that was very significant because remember, uh, Abraham is out like a light. So church family, what participation did Abraham have in this covenant that is binding forever regarding God's promise to Abraham? What participation did he have? Only this, he did build an altar, he did put animal uh, sacrifice on it, but God didn't agree with Abraham. He never, God didn't ask Abraham his opinion. God didn't say, okay, Abraham, I'm sticking out my hand, and you need to stick your hand out a little further over the sacrifice. No, basically it's Romans 12. Abraham presented himself, Right? And God took over. God shook, and I believe it's this. By the the witness of two or three, the truth shall be established, right? That's both in Old and New Testament. When you talk about atonement, the Bible's very clear that the atonement is between the Father and the Son as an agreement. You guys know this answer deeper than you think. We go back to Abraham again. Do you remember when God told Abraham, Hi, Abraham, hope you're doing well. Uh, I have a mission for you. And you could just see old Abraham. Yes, sir. What is it? Well, I want you to take your son, Isaac, your only son. Think of this. How many sons did Abraham have? He had two sons. Ishmael was older. God says to Abraham, I want you to take your son. So Abraham could have said, which one do you want? God God didn't even give him the chance to answer. He says, I want you to take your son, your only son. That immediately took Abraham to Sarah's womb. Oh. Not the other son that was through my efforts and through our human planning, but the son that was a miracle child. <laughs> yeah, that one. Watch this. This, is, this was only known to Abraham until it was written down. Take your son, take him to a mountain I will show you. And the Bible tells us that from the moment that order was given to Abraham... He got two of his attendants and Isaac and nobody knew nothing except Abraham. The attendants are going. Isaac is going. They got wood. They got probably donkeys or horses or camels, right? They're on their way. 
How, how, many, how, long, how, many, how many days was the journey? Three days. Isaac doesn't know what's going on. The servants, they don't know what's going on. From the moment that God told Abraham, I want you to offer up your son, Abraham had to deal with that by himself, in his mind and heart, for three days. It wasn't resolved until God intervened because Isaac, right, was bound, laid on the altar. And by the way, the word in Hebrew echoes Amos 3.3. This is very, very important. Amos 3.3 says, how can two walk together unless they are in agreement? Did you know that same word appears, that same argument is made that when the whole journey for three days, that everyone's in agreement. And then, at the last moment, God, or Abraham tells his son, son, I want you to lay down. Because Isaac says, father, here's the wood, here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, can you imagine this? Abraham looks at his boy. Can you imagine what was in his heart? In fact, those of you who, who uh, read or bought, everyone should buy. Everyone in the world, <laughs> buy the book, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And I, I'm not sure, but it might be, it might be the chapter t- uh, called The Blessedness of, possess, uh, of Possessing Nothing. It's great when God does it, not when the World Economic Forum does it. <laughs> they just said that you're, pretty soon you're not going to own anything and you're going to love it. I don't think so. God says in, in his word through Abraham, you can have everything you want. Did you know? I mean, God, God, God is saying to us tonight, you can have whatever you have. You, 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 you can have it all. You just don't own it. That'll straighten things up real quick. Did you, did you just get that new car? Good for you. Enjoy the smell. <laughs> Just know it's not yours. It's his. And he can take it anytime he wants. So God tells Isaac, my son, in the old King James, says it perfectly. My son, God will provide himself the sacrifice. Isaac laid down, Abraham took a knife to plunge it into the chest of his son and God stopped him. Question, God says to Abraham, now I know that you love me and that you'll not withhold anything from me. Does Isaac die? No, God stops him. No human sacrifice, God doesn't accept human sacrifice. It wasn't gonna happen, did you know that? It wasn't gonna happen. Well, then why did, it, why did God go through all of that? Because Abraham had Isaac in between him and God. Abraham, between Abraham and God and their relationship was an idol. And that idol was Isaac. God knew exactly what was in Abraham's heart. Abraham did not know what was in his heart. Until God revealed it to him in that very moment. And then what's amazing is if you look at the ages, Isaac is somewhere around his late 20s or early 30s. He could have easily overpowered his father because the two witnesses, or the, I should say the two servants, they stayed at the base of the hilltop. Oh, by the way, anybody know what the name of the hilltop was called? Moriah. The high ground of Moriah. Moriah sits like this, everyone. So here's all valleys, and then there's this plateau, there's this mesa, but it's sloped. This is called Moriah, okay? And the top of Moriah, where my elbow is, is called Golgotha. Whenever you make a sacrifice to God, you always go to the high ground. The high ground of Moriah is Golgotha, 
or the name Calvary. You are in Calvary Chapel tonight, Golgotha Chapel. It means the place of the skull. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? You're in Skull Chapel tonight. <laughs> Jesus was crucified at the top of Skull Chapel, or Skull Hill, I should say, right? That's where Isaac was offered up as. Take now thy son, thy only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Isaac and Abraham were living out Bible prophecy. Did they know that? I don't, th I don't think they knew that, but I don't know. But God provided, the Bible says that in the thicket, in the, in the weeds or in the branches, the bramble, there was a ram caught. His horns were caught. And God provided right there in the spot. But the whole point is, Isaac willingly laid down his life, never fought against his dad, in full agreement, believing. Both of them believed because of the promise that through Isaac your seed shall be blessed. Father and son believe that if this boy dies, if I die on this altar, God's going to raise me up from the dead. Amen. That's why you read that Abraham was justified by faith. God will even raise up my boy. Remarkable. Now, um, did I answer the question? Was that all? <laughs> oh, no. Okay, the two immutable is the father and the son in agreement to, together. And the witness, you say, what would you say two or three witnesses for? Father, son, in agreement, the Holy Spirit would have been the third witness to that transaction. Father, son, Abraham, Isaac, and you've got the two witnesses of the servants watching on, looking on as well. Anyway, amazing, amazing. Does Hebrews 7.18 call for the annulling of the entire Old Testament Law, including the tithes of the Levitical priesthood, and if so or not, why? I believe that it does call for the annulling of, the ending of the Levitical priesthood um, offerings. Uh, the, we just read this, by the way. Didn't we just read this in our daily Bible reading? Um, where the completion of the law is in Christ, there are what we would say laws, maybe, I don't know if we should call them laws, but for example, um, this issue of tithing that mentions, so does Hebrews 7, 18 annul the entire Old Testament law, including the tithes. You gotta remember something. There was a portion uh, that, you know we talk about 10%, that's the tithe. The, the word tithe is the tenth. So, it's funny how we do things because somewhere people would say, oh, the Old Testament's 10%. By the way, don't, don't even attempt to correct me because this is what I used to do. Well, the Old Testament was 10%. I live in the New Testament. So I, I used to go to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. That's where I got saved, discipled, ordained, all of that there. But when I first started attending there, and there are thousands and thousands of people, and I'm looking around, and there's Mercedes Benz and Ferraris in the parking lot, and then they would pass the plate, I didn't understand. I was an ignorant new believer, and I thought this. And by the way, I was an ignorant new believer with too much money for my age. This is always the, always the case. So when the, when the plate went by, I, let, I just handed it to the next guy. Because they passed the plate. Remember, we, we used to do that here. And then COVID hit, and then we just never did it again. Um, but they would pass the plate by, or the bag, or whatever it is. And I, here's, this is my thought. Now, don't tell anybody this. It would be horrible. <laughs> I thought, look around. This place, is, this place is blessed. They don't need my, my money. They're doing great. I had no idea what it meant. but I was thinking 10%. So God's doing fine. Look, he's not hurting. I'll keep, I'll, I'll, we're good. 
truth is, I was such a hoard, a hoarder. There's only one thing I've ever hoarded in my life. And when I was young and I was making ridiculous money, the more money I made, the cheaper I got. <laughs> That's a sickness, you know. I wound up having, at 19 years of age, I had so much money, all legal. <laughs> and I remember, I remember buying shoes. Uh, I could afford any shoes I wanted. I remember buying, remember something called Wallabies? At Kmart, because they were dirt cheap. And that's a dangerous thing. That's why God, God took all my money away at a young age. He took it all away. I was making more money than my dad. It was crazy. And it all had to go away because I couldn't handle it. You want to know why? I couldn't spend it. You say, wait, you got that wrong, right? You had all this money, so you spent it. No, not me. And so in my life, I had to have my Abraham moment <laughs> where God had to put, God said, you got to put this on the, idol, uh, on the altar. It's either mammon or me. Listen, when you have money, you have a tendency to not trust God. And I'll spare you the pain of it all, but he took it all away like that. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life outside of a couple of things. Kids, Lisa, my salvation, you. Gone, like that. It was the best thing ever happened. And so when we talk about tithe, oh, tithe, do you tithe? Well, you know, is it before? Is it before taxes or after? The priest in the Old Testament got 10%. If you do all of the offerings that a Jew was required of in Scripture, I may be off going from memory now, but it's close to 30% of your income went to the things of God. A tithe went to the priesthood. You got that? That's not true in the New Testament. It's not true in the New Testament. Do you know what the number is in the New Testament? It's not a tenth. It's exactly what... It's exactly what, I think his name's Joseph Proctor. I may have his, fa his first name wrong. Somebody over here said all. They're exactly correct. The, the New Testament believer is supposed to give all of it to God. Did you know that? Jo uh, I think his name's Joseph. You can look at it later. You know Proctor and Gamble? Yeah. Proctor. The guy, when he started his company, he was completely broke. And he said, um, God, I'm going to dedicate this company to you. I have an idea. He had nothing. So what, are you gonna, what do you have to lose if you have nothing? God, I'm going to give you 90% of whatever this company makes. 90%. So what did God do? I bet you there's a meeting in heaven. God probably said, man, if we don't bless this guy, he's going to starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. It's amazing. So no, New Testament is, uh, you can't set a number. You can't... You can't set a number. There are some people, they, they can't give at all. So what are you supposed to do? I think it's pretty clear from Scripture. You're to dedicate yourself to prayer for the church. But that's a rarity. And I'm going to say something, and, I'm, and I'll move on from this. The church, the, the church as a general organism in the world today but predominantly the Western church. Its days are numbered. It's going to evaporate in the not too distant future, and I'll tell you the reason why. Um, as we know it, the church historically has been the epicenter of generosity to any culture that it's in. Even where the church is poor, in poor countries, the church still gives, and what God does is he blesses churches that give, and that circle happens because he uses the church as a conduit to minister to others, right? So we live in, a, we live in California, we used to be affluent, but at the price of housing and gasoline, we're now all broke, <laughs> right? Which means what? Which means we, we can't give like we used to. We don't, we don't make it anymore. And taxes have gone through the roof. So now we are, quote, tithing 
to the government. That's what we're really doing because the government in this state is God. It thinks it is. And so you're put into this tight spot. That's tough enough. But what's interesting is the young generation of believers, they don't give. Most believers 40 years of age and under do not tithe. They don't, they don't, they don't give nothing. They don't give a thing. They were like, I used to be. And you're going to see works of God uh, go through some sort of refining process. God's work will not suffer. God's work will accomplish what he wants it to do. There'll, be, there'll just be less people involved in the blessing of when the day of reckoning comes. But in the, the young generation today, they don't give. It's, a, it's actually a science. It's a science. Churches know this. And that's too bad. I wonder how much that explains maybe some of the lack of initiative and blessing and creativity in the young people today is that they don't put God first. Because let's be honest, if you put God first, he's going he's gonna to say, put down on this table the thing that you, you, want, you, know, you want the most because you cannot have idols before me. So somebody like us might say, well, here's, here's this money or here's this property or here's this the stock, or here's this business. To a 40-year-old, it's, all right, here's my call to duty, here's my Xbox, uh, here's my Game Boy. (laughs) It's a very strange time we're in in this world. What's the difference between apostasy and backsliding? I thought we just answered this those last few weeks. Were you not here? (laughs) That's what we're talking about in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 9 and 10 talks about apostasy and backsliding. A person who's an apostate is not a believer. They're not a Christian. A backslider has to be saved to backslide. Don't you ever confuse a backslider with an apostate individual. Apostates are lost. They're they're on their way to hell. They're on a greased, (laughs) greased lightning rail to hell. Apostates, listen, apostates start out looking just like us. Talking just like we do, looking just like we do, but when hardships come, they wind up giving up. Apostates can also be very prone to having things steal what they know out of their head, where they know, they they know, they can tell you, Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. They know that in their head. But it's never gone down into, heart, into their heart. And so when something more exciting comes along, an apostate will leave. Or when difficulties hit. That's why trials are so important. I know none of us will sign up for a trial. None of us want to sign. We won't do it. But when they come, we, we hang on. Because trials are custom tailor-made by Almighty God to visit your life as a believer to knock what you have in your head in belief and knock it down into your heart so that it becomes faith. Apostates only have it in the head. Someone wrote a book. You can buy it somewhere. I think it's called Almost a Christian. It's all in your head. Almost a Christian is, you're a professor, you can be a professor at a Christian seminary. You can have a doctorate in theology. You can write books on Christian doctrine. You say, I can't, I can't believe that, Pastor Jack. That's horrible. That's, it is horrible. It's horrible. But it's true. I don't know if I like that. Well, how about this? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that on the day of judgment, there's going to be those who did miracles in his name. How many of you, how many miracles have you done? They did miracles in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They raised the dead. How many, have you done those? And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. They used his name because listen, God God will not deny his name. He'll use his name and he'll even use a weird vessel Isn't that strange? You say, I don't like that either. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was a weirdo. (laughs) Look at the weirdos in the Bible. Samson was a weirdo. But you got Nebuchadnezzar. 
You've got Cyrus. You've got people that God uses for his own purposes. But there are people that God will honor his word and do a work for, if God wants to reach you and touch you, he'll, listen, he'll go right through the, the vessel and reach your life and he'll settle the score at the end. And there's going to be people who are going to go to hell who did miracles and Jesus said, I never knew you. Can you imagine? I don't want to imagine. So that is, that's apostate. And by the way, the Bible says apostate is going to increase in the last days. You're seeing it happen now. But backsliders, I love backsliders. They're so messed up. An apostate is off skipping off, clicking their heels and having a great time. A backslider, their mug, their face is dragging in the ground. They're lying to you. You go, hey, haven't seen your church for a while. Oh, I, I, uh, they start getting twitches and stuff. It's like, what's wrong with you? Nothing. What? Why? You look guilty or something. Let's pray. Oh, I don't know if I can. A backslider is all messed up. They can't sin right. It's great. A backslider, man, I'm ba They start backsliding. They start walking away from God and they go back. They maybe they call up Bubbles again, ask her out on a date and can't even sin right. They're all messed up. Oh, my, what's wrong with you? I can't. They have not, listen, a backslider is not happy in the church and they're not happy in the world because the Holy Spirit is just, just kicking them around like a tin can. It's awesome. It's beautiful. Now, an apostate, they're having a great time. Does that answer your question? Very important. If you're out sending up a storm and you come to church on Sunday and you, you feel nothing, you're apostate. If you're out sending up a storm and you are miserable and you go and you say, what did I do that? Oh God, please forgive me. And then you just bounce over to the next bit of rebellion and you're miserable. And then you come to church on Sunday and I can see you because the apostate's like this. And the backslider's like this. Does that make sense? Do you believe that Hebrews 1 is appropriate defense that there are no modern day prophets? Let's define the word prophet because you don't even have to talk about Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, though, lays this foundation that uh, at the beginning, God spoke, right, uh, by the prophets to the fathers, but in these last days has spoken unto us by his only son. There are no more biblical prophets in the context of Hebrews 1. No more. And there are no more fathers in the reference of Hebrews 1. You say, well, yeah, but why is the gift of prophecy found in the New Testament as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? That's a completely different meaning. Prophet, when you talk about prophet, Old Testament prophet, they spoke Bible prophecy. They spoke about the future. Listen up. Those of you, and we're going to have to end soon, sadly. That's just, this went by too fast. Is uh, Those of you who are uh, involved in, I hope you're not involved in this, the New Apostolic uh, Reformation group, yikes. Or even some parts of the Assembly of uh, God. Assemblies of God are wonderful missionaries all over the world. They're so evangelistic. But listen, if you start getting into... Uh, the wrong use of the meaning to the word New Testament prophets, you've got a, you've got a New Testament prophet, uh, Agabus, remember him? Where he says to Paul, Who's, whose belt is this? He says to the group, who owns this belt? Paul says, that's my belt. And he puts it on and he says, I tell you that the man who owns this belt would be bound and taken to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. But listen, that would have been a word of knowledge, even though he was called a prophet. Listen, this is very important, a word of knowledge, where that's God giving somebody information in advance that is needed. Prophet is the, in the New Testament is this. The gift of prophet is one who puts forth, I like to put it this way, it just works for me, 
The New Testament meaning to the gift prophet is to profit forth, to forth or project the word of God is a prophet. You say, well, isn't that a preacher? No. Isn't that a pastor? No. There are, there, there are some aspects that overlap, but if you want to talk about a modern day prophet in our world, in our mind, Billy Graham was probably the last living prophet in a New Testament definition. Billy Graham didn't say, I see, hang on a minute, or thus saith the Lord. You never heard Billy Graham say that. Okay? When somebody says, oh man, this guy prophesied over me and he said this and he said that. Listen, that is more of a word of knowledge and we're applying the wrong verbiage to that, to that gift being used. When somebody says, I had a prophet tell me that I'm supposed to marry that guy over there. That's called, that's called uh, Nicolaitan or shepherding movement. That's abuse. So the prophets spoke and you could quantify and qualify what it is that they said by the fulfillment of prophecy. Okay? New Testament prophet is someone who would hold forth an evangelistic type. Greg Laurie would operate in that. See, what's an evangelist? Yes, there's overlapping, holding forth an evangelistic message, putting forth, but to tell somebody their future and call that prophecy, that's dangerous. Does it make sense? If that stimulates some of you or you disagree, that's completely fine. Just go study this. I recommend a fantastic book to you. It's, um, it's called The Systematic Theology of... Uh, Systematic Theology of, of, of Pentecost, and I think it's written by Guy Duffield and Nathaniel Van Cleef, is a fantastic book. And you say, wait, on, on Pentecostalism uh, or Pentecostal theology? Yeah, but this is a fantastic book. You, you, you should get that. It explains those things pretty well. But one more, one more, because we have 30 seconds left. Since God disciplines those whom he loves, yep, could an illness that isn't healed after much fasting and prayer be his discipline? Well, of course it could be his discipline. Of course it could be. It's, it's in the realm of being possible. Um, know this. This is a good place to end. Number one, you and I live in a fallen world. And you and I are going to get sick because we live in a fallen world. For example, uh, right now there's uh, flus going around. Different flus. Oh, I got the flu. God doesn't love me anymore. <laughs> Listen, you have that kind of theology? You're going you're gonna to crash and burn. That's not how it works, friend. You and I live in a fallen world. God loves you. If you go drive across an intersection today and some drunk drives by and hits your car, it doesn't mean God stopped loving you. It means you live in a fallen world where there's drunks. We live in a crazy place. Listen, because we love God and we're his kids, he doesn't bubble wrap us. Okay? So the thing is this. So yeah, but I've been sick for a long time and I love God and, and I've I haven't done anything wrong. I've asked him to show me what I've done wrong. Listen, God is so, he's so efficient that if you've done something wrong, when you ask him, he's going to tell you. You're going to know. If you ask God, show me what I've done wrong, and he doesn't tell you, you didn't do anything wrong. So well, what am I sick? We live in a fallen world. Also this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that if we as Christians take lightly communion, the communion service, and we have sin in our hearts against our brother or sister or something, or in our life, or we've sinned against God, we're in the family, but the Bible tells us God can discipline you with sickness. It says in 1 Corinthians 11. Go read it later. So there is some sickness that is brought on by disobedience, but I believe that individual is going to know that. If the person tonight is saying, I've been sick, I've, I've searched my heart, I've 
done everything to figure out. In fact, notice the question. The question says uh, uh, that they fasted and they prayed and they're still sick. I appreciate that. And that's the right thing to do. Just don't connect this. Make sure that when you fast and pray and seek God for the answer, that you're fasting and praying to seek God for the answer. Don't think that by fasting and praying that you're going to be healed of the sickness. That's not biblical and that's not even true. If you and I are, look, we have, I'm not living in sin. I don't have any, I, I don't have any known sin in my life. It doesn't mean I'm a sinner. I'm, that I'm not a sinner, I am a sinner. I have grumpy moods, I have temper, I have... But I'm not living in sin. Are you hearing me? I'm not doing, I'm not gambling on the side. I don't see porn. I don't shoot kitties. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> but I had to go to a doctor on Monday because I've been having pain for a long time in my neck. And so I just finally gave up. I got to go. And I'm not, a, I love doctors that I don't have to work with. I worked with doctors for 13 years. They're the most difficult people in the world to work with in a research setting. But a good doctor is, you got a good doctor, hang on, hang on to him, hang on to her. And so this, this one doctor was highly recommended to me by a very good source. And so I went, it's a neurological thing. And so, um, and so I went and they ask you, you know, fill, we fill out, why are you here? And it was fun because I just said, a pain in the neck. <laughs> That's what I wrote down. I wrote pain in the neck with an exclamation point. And so I walked in there and the lady said, you know, wh why are you here? Because you know you write it down, they ask you 10 times. And then they go, can you fill out this form? I just filled that out three forms ago. You got to do it again. So now why are you here? I said, pain in the neck. And I thought she, I think, I think she thought I was criticizing her. I'm not sure. No, I'm, I'm, no. I have a pain in my neck. And so, uh, great doctor and all this stuff. Uh, and he, he did his thing and told me what's going on and all this stuff. Um, but I have to tell you, when you get these things answered in your life, these questions that I hope is happening tonight, not once, he said, okay, we're going to start here. If that doesn't work, then we're going to move to this. If that doesn't work, we're going to move on to this. And then, and then, and then we'll just cut your head off. <laughs> Not once did it enter my mind, oh, Jesus, I thought you loved me. No, you know what entered my mind? Is this world stinks. <laughs> Lord, it's just part of being in my mid-60s, dragging. Do you understand this? It's like, come on. In my heart, in my, in my heart, I'm, I'm, I don't know, 21 in my heart. Sometimes in my brain, 21. And you try to jump over the fence, and then you're, then you're at 66. You're telling, the, you're telling the paramedic, I'm 66. It's the way it is. God's put eternity in our hearts. We all feel young on the inside, and this is the way it is. But suffering, uh, the things that we go through in this life, when you read your Bible enough, I want to encourage you. You read your Bible, and you live long enough, you realize, wow, heaven is getting sweeter every... I can't wait! And this is part of the beauty of it. Well, what do you have cancer? What have you got this? We live in a fallen world. He loves me. Yeah, but what if this, what if that happens? He loves me. Right before service tonight, a friend of mine got a hold of me and just was sharing with this horrific news. But God loves them. And we live in a fallen world. You know, if this tonight was just for this moment, for some of you to realize... Theoretically, hypothetically, it's in the realm of possible that we could all find out by Friday we don't have any jobs. Now, that would be an impossibility before. But we live in an age right now where somebody could press a button and everything's gone black or everything's gone dead. 
Right theoretically, it's true. Somebody could press a button and we have no light switches tonight by the time we get home. No energy, no oven, no, no warmth, no cold. No. What do you do? Please, my friends, the last thing you, in fact, never. I like this. I have no electricity. God, why are you doing this to me? Oh my gosh. If that's you, I mean, either A, you must have just got saved, or you need to get saved. But then I just insulted all new believers because they have great faith. Great faith. A new believer goes, all right, man, there's no electricity. God, what are you going to do now? You know, they'll, they'll, they'll. But for somebody to say, oh my gosh, right after this sermon or this Q&A, I went on the parking lot and my tire was flat. Where's God? If that's you, um, you, need to, you need to toughen up. Christianity, you, me, the church, Christ in us is absolutely resilient, Teflon, plated, supernatural, possessed by the Holy Spirit, uh, as the Puritans used to say, that we are invincible until the day God calls us home. And until then, you live in boldness, you live in confidence, because God has promised and he's faithful. And he'll never, he'll never abandon us. If you and I wind up going on a cruise ship, 5,000 people, the whole thing sinks, and you're the only one that swims to an island and makes it there, you're going to realize as a believer you're not alone. I remember before I was a Christian, always feeling alone. Feeling alone. I always felt Lonely as a Christian. I mean, before I was a Christian, always alone. In fact, busy at work before I was a Christian, and then knowing that tomorrow, for example, tomorrow's Friday, I gotta get on the phone, gotta find out what's happening this weekend. Who's going where? What's happening? Anything going on? Hey guys, anything going on? Why did I do that? I didn't want to be alone because of loneliness. And the moment I became a Christian, there are some things that happened instantaneous, by the way, when I became a Christian. There's some things I don't need to talk about that was always present in my life. Always. Something was there. I can't explain it to you. You just, well, you just said you're lonely all the time. Yeah, I'm talking about something that's just dark. Not good. The day I became a Christian... June 20th, Monday night, 1977, that thing was gone and it never visited me again, ever. But at the exact same time, at the exact same time, I then began to sought out places to be alone with God because I didn't need that hole filled anymore. He filled it so much that I began to go look for places to be alone with him and never have I been lonely since. I sure hope you know that about him. If you don't, you need to talk to him about that, okay? Father, thank you. Lord, I hope that tonight has meant something to us, to someone this evening and kind of a casual time together and I, I think it's sweet and I, pr I pray that you're blessed by it too and Lord God, that we just want to publicly thank you. In fact, church, we stand to your feet right now? Lord, we just want to publicly thank you for Jesus and for all that you've done for us, Lord. And as we begin, Lord, to head toward the, the weekend coming up, Father, I pray that you would bring to remembrance things that might be used to invite a friend to maybe not necessarily come to church. Maybe that's just too much for, for some people. I know it is. But maybe, Lord, for, for us to maybe say, hey, listen, I, would you be willing if I stayed home from church this week and you and I got together at Starbucks or somewhere and watched the church service online? You want to you wanna watch the church service with me online before you... You come, maybe it's overwhelming and you can't handle it. I get that. 
Friends, there's, there's people in our lives that are terrified. They're terrified of this world, and because they don't know God, they're terrified of God. And then there's you. Ask God to give you a creative thought as to how to reach your friends for Jesus. Sit down. Watch a message or read a chapter to them. Ask them questions. Lord, tonight we, your kids, are asking you, come back, Jesus. Come. Lord, I'm asking you to come tonight. Wouldn't it be great? Oh, Lord, please come tonight. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. As we close in this song, we bless your holy name. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's bless him with our song right now together.